Hello everyone and welcome to our video about the interrelationship between photosynthesis and respiration. This is going to be the first video in our little photosynthesis series and the whole idea of this one is to go through this first reference on that section on specification 5.2.1a looking at the interrelationship between the process of photosynthesis and respiration including the relationship between raw materials and products of those two processes. First thing we need to understand then is a little bit about the importance of photosynthesis. Now we are kind of going back to some basics from probably what you did at primary school or at least key stage three. When we're talking about photosynthesis this is where we are going to have organisms trapping light energy from the sun and then converting that into chemical energy in the form of these organic molecules. Now, what we're actually going to see in order to do this in organic molecules, which will be your water and your carbon dioxide, are actually going to be taken in and then we're going to release oxygen. When we talk about photosynthesis, this is an example of autotrophic nutrition. Now, what we mean by autotrophic nutrition is that the organic molecules are being synthesized from inorganic ones. And if we wanted to take this a step further, because we are using light in order to bring this about, we would refer to organisms carrying out photosynthesis as photoautotrophs, because they're going to be synthesizing these organic molecules from inorganic ones using energy from light, basically. Now, if we go back to that real basic stuff we did in key stage three stroke primary school, we know that photosynthesis is the basis of many food chains. And therefore it is going to be providing this energy in the form of these various chemical compounds for consumers and even longer term for the decomposers. One other way that we can describe photosynthesis is as an example of carbon fixation. Now, what we mean by that phrase carbon fixation is that we have a process where carbon dioxide is being converted into our sugars. So what we're seeing here is we're taking our inorganic carbon in the form of carbon dioxide, and we're then going to convert it into our organic molecules, in this example, our sugars. Now, if we think back to our GCSE work, we hopefully remember that photosynthesis is an endothermic process. Remember, endo basically means inside. So what we're actually doing here is we're taking energy in and therefore it is an endothermic reaction. We also are going to require the addition of electrons to bring this about. Now, because we're adding electrons during this process of photosynthesis, which we'll see in more detail in one of our future videos, then we have got a reduction reaction. So remember, we can go back to some of our GCSE chemistry there, where we've got good old oil rig. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons. So during this process, we have a gain of electrons. Therefore, it is a reduction reaction. Before we can jump into this interrelationship between our two key processes, we need to understand a little bit, an overview, if you will, of the other process, respiration. Now, hopefully we do remember that respiration is carried out by all living cells and that during respiration, organic molecules are then going to be oxidized to release the energy that's stored within them. We will have a look at the process of respiration in a lot more detail when we do our series of videos on respiration in our module five work. So, what we're really seeing here then is that when we made all of these lovely organic molecules in photosynthesis, respiration is then going to be utilizing some of those organic molecules in this process. So they're linked in that way that the product of photosynthesis is going to be the raw material of respiration. We do have another term we should look at in terms of how organisms obtain their energy, and that term is heterotroph. When we talk about the heterotrophs, 
these are going to get their energy by digesting these complex organic molecules that other organisms have actually provided to them. So heterotrophs will be things like animals. Okay, so the animals have eaten something like a plant and then they digest those complex organic molecules that are in the plant and then they're able to produce these smaller organic molecules that can be used as a respiratory substrate. So they've not actually created those organic molecules themselves. They've had to consume another organism in order to get them. If we now delve a little bit into this interrelationship, so respiration photosynthesis. What we've got first of all then is the balance symbol equation for respiration in this top box, the balance symbol equation for photosynthesis in the bottom box. And hopefully what we can see straight away is that if we look at our respiration, carbon dioxide and water. So six carbon dioxide and six water molecules. If we then look at photosynthesis, six carbon dioxide and six water molecules are the raw materials. If we then do the same thing, but looking at the reactants, our raw materials in respiration, we have C6H12O6 plus 6O2. And if we look at our products in photosynthesis, it's exactly the same. So what we can see here is that the products of photosynthesis are the raw materials for respiration and the products of respiration are the raw materials for photosynthesis. What that means is that if we consider some little closed systems, and you may have seen people, use these were all the rage many years ago, where people had bottle gardens. So basically they had this huge glass bottle and it had a stopper in the top. So what they actually did was they set up this basically mini ecosystem. So what we had in there were a range of our little plants, etc. And what we would then do, once we planted it all up, we'd seal the top completely. So at that point, obviously we've got a certain proportion of air that was in there at the point of our closing the bottle. So in that air, we would have carbon dioxide, we'd have oxygen, but our little plants here, they're obviously going to be using the oxygen during respiration. Now, what we find is they're then going to be releasing carbon dioxide. However, they are also going to be taking in carbon dioxide using photosynthesis and releasing oxygen. And this is why we can actually have these completely sealed systems that basically are self-supporting because when they're carrying out both photosynthesis and respiration, they're both producing the raw materials for the other reaction. So as long as it's a sealed system, we will have that continuing. What we now need to understand is something called the compensation point. Before we can delve into exactly what that is, we need a quick reminder about when these two processes take place. And again, this is going back to some real basic stuff, which some of my year 13s did embarrass themselves with by getting it wrong. I am still disappointed. The first thing is that photosynthesis only happens during the day because photosynthesis requires light energy. Respiration, however, happens all the time. It's not light dependent in any way, shape or form. So respiration happening all the time, photosynthesis only during the day. Now, what we can say is that if we've got photosynthesis and respiration occurring at the same rate, then our plant would be described as being at its compensation point. And by that, what we mean is that there is no net gain or loss of carbohydrate. Because if we've got photosynthesis happening at the same rate as respiration, then whatever carbohydrate we are producing, we are then also breaking down. So what we see is that the total amount of carbohydrate is going to be static, it's going to remain stable because we've got no net gain, no net loss of that carbohydrate. That is the compensation point. You will also see a second phrase used, which is called the compensation period. Now, whenever we're looking at a period, that is always time related. 
So the compensation period is just the time taken to reach the compensation point. And it's not one set time. It depends on what plant we've got. So different plants will have different lengths of time taken to reach the compensation point. So therefore they have different compensation periods. They can give us a little graph like this one underneath here. So what we've got on our graph, first of all, the X axis, this is giving us our time of day in hours. Y axis is your carbohydrate in grams per hour. Now on our graph itself, we have two lines. We've got this red bell shaped curve there. That's our photosynthesis. And then the green dashed line, that is respiration for us. Now, what we need to remember then is that the compensation point is where we have no net gain or loss of carbohydrate. So this is when respiration and photosynthesis are happening at the same rate. So basically where those two lines actually cross, so we've got one here and one here, those are the compensation points. So if we wanted to know the compensation period, we'd obviously bring that down using a ruler carefully to your x-axis and then we can read off the time. So that will give us our compensation period then. One of those key differences in types of plant that we can have then are those that are adapted to live in the shade versus those that are adapted to live at higher light intensities, the ones that live out in full sun, for example. Now, our shade plants are specifically adapted to cope with these lower light intensities. That's where they've actually adapted to grow. Now, what we find is that to allow them to do this, then they're going to reach these compensation points sooner than those plants that are adapted to grow in full sun. So what we will find is because they're going to reach compensation points sooner, their compensation periods would be shorter. As always, I do suggest that you subscribe to the channel so you can see when I next upload a video. And don't forget to head on over to the A-Level Biology website where you'll find a range of other resources that will hopefully help you in your study of the A-Level Biology course.